Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So then we go with electrostatic free energy. So what is the principle of electrostatic free energy? This interaction between charge. two charge resistors. One is charge, positive charge, one is negative charge. We can do it in two, two different ways. Either you can identify the, the atoms which can be able to form an ion pair, high potential to form an ion pair. In this case, you can see the positive charge atom, right? For example, which residues? Lysine, arginine, and histidine, and the negative charge residues glutamic acid and aspartic acid. Right, see the uh, nitrogen atom in the positive charge and the oxygen atom in the negative charge, and see the distance. Right, we can use the different distance cutoff, and you can see up to 4 to 6 angstrom we can use for the ion pairs. Right, so if we take the 4 uh, angstrom, we can get the potential ion pairs. And we can extend up to 6 angstrom, but there will be weak uh, salt bridges, even that you can account if you use the distance of 6 angstrom. So, in the 4 in this 4 angstrom, right, for example, this is the 1 atom, this is the n, and here this is the O. You can calculate the distance, and the distance should be less than 4 angstrom, and then see the location of these atoms, whether they are buried or it is exposed. If it is buried, it contribute more then they are exposed. Buried what is the definition for buried? Access. Accessible surface area you can see with less than 5 percent you can see this buried. So, in this case you put 3 kilo kel per mole and for the surface and we can take 1 kilo kel per mole for the standard case. To avoid the deep calculations, the extensive calculations you can see the ion pairs based on just distance and give the weightage to each ion pair you can see the contribution from the ion pairs or you can directly calculate how to calculate directly the electrostatic free energy. So, you can use E is proportional to the product of these charges and inversely proportional to the distance between them. So, you can see Q 1 and Q 2 they are the charges of these two atoms and R is the distance between them. What is the epsilon? That is the permittivity of the medium. So, you can see this is a vacuum that right? you can see this value. So, in this is given as 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0 or you can use epsilon as 80 for the, the water and 4 for the protein. So, you have the Q we know that R we know epsilon we know in this case for any case you can calculate the uh, electrostatic free energy. So, Q 1 and Q 2 we know the predetermined parameters for 20 different amino acid residues for example, glycine. So, they have different atom types right because based on the linkage and the location of each atom this O my N C T and C O right we give the data. So, now we have the q 1, we have the q 2. So, with the distance we get from the 3D structures because the 3D structures we get x y z coordinates. So, r we know then q also we know that so, in this case you can easily calculate the electrostatic uh, free energy. So, we can calculate the hydrophobic free energy and the electrostatic free energy. So, if how to do the hydrogen bonding free energy? So, what is the hydrogen bonds? Share by two atoms. Hydrogen by two electronegative atoms. Right? This is a interaction right? for the hydrogen bond atom with the electronegative atom plus another electronegative atom. For example, if you see the atom with the attached to the hydrogen, this is called donor, right? And the one which accepts this, this hydrogen, right? This is the acceptor. So we need two electronegative atoms like this A and D, right? One is attached with hydrogen. So and the distance between this acceptor and donor this is about uh, 2.3 to 3.3 3 angstrom right approximately you can put 3 angstrom between the 2 heavy atoms right this is how we uh, uh, identify the hydrogen bonds right in the system. So, now we can identify the hydrogen bonds right in the protein structures how to identify the hydrogen bonds because we have the coordinates. So, we know the distance. So, we put the donor and acceptor right this uh, there within the distance of 3, 3 angstrom right we can use this program HP plus to get the hydrogen bonds in protein structures. It will give you the main chain main chain hydrogen bond, main chain side chain hydrogen bond and side chain side chain hydrogen bonds and all. So, approximately we can put 1 kilo kel per mole 
actually head in once you can have 1 to 5 kilocal per mole. So, to approximate we put 20 kilocal per mole for the different situations and then you can calculate the total energy in a protein due to hydrogen bonds. For the hydrophobic free energy, how to calculate the total free energy due to hydrophobic free energy? Use accessibility, atomic selection parameters, use for all atoms and sum up and we get the data. For the electrostatic free energy, get the ion pairs and give weightage to each ion pair we can get. Otherwise, you can use the distance and the charge directly calculate the electrostatic free energy. Hydrogen bonds, you can see the hydrogen bonds right approximately you can see about 0.73 hydrogen bonds per, in, per, per protein. So, in this case you see the hydrogen bonds right, and then see uh, different weightage to the each hydrogen bond and see the free energy due to hydrogen bonds. So, now see the Van der Waals interactions. So, how to explain Van der Waals interactions? For example, if you two atoms are very far, right, then what will happen? They attract. So, if it is very far then they very distant then no attraction no, no interactions right that is very far. When you come close to each other to some distance r then what will have it will have the they have the attractive force at a minimum distance of r they will come close to each other to at minimum at a distance of r you will have the attractive force. When it is very close right very close to each other then what will happen? It will have the repulsive force finally, it is dominated by the repulsive interactions. So, we can use this graph to explain the attractive force and repulsive force as well as net force. So, here this uh, uh, red one this attractive force which is very far away there is uh, no attractive force at some this point of distance like the x axis distance and y axis the electrostatic potential you can see say force or the energy right. So, if you see to some distance that we have the attractive force that is favorable interactions. Then we go closer to each other again more closer if you see more closer then it is because of afterwards this repulsion the high repulsive interactions right you can see this is the green one the dominant with the repulsive interactions. So, combine these two together you can have the Leonard James potentials right this is the graph how they look like. So, we can derive this equation right using uh, this graphs right using a 6 L potential this energy is equal to A i j by R i j power 12 and B i j by R i j power 6. Okay, this is why this is called 6 L potential because the power of R j power 6 and R j power 12. If this is separation is very small which, which term will dominate? Repulsion will dominate. So, you can see R 12 that is very high because it is very close then repulsion will dom dominate you know, the high repulsive energy. Then if you move together then the R j 6 will dominate then we have the attractive force then we have attractive interactions. So, here which is attractive term which is repulsive term? Positive. Positive is repulsive term and the negative is attractive term. So, from this you can uh, estimate the interactions due to Van der Waals free energy. So, here you can see this the, here we have two constants A i j and B i j. This A i j and B i j depends upon the Van der Waals radius and well depth right. What is Van der Waals radius and Van der Waals well depth right we as we discussed it is a combination of attractive and repulsive forces. So, we will get a graph like this. And you can see that this is the depth, right? So from here for the equilibrium distance, okay. So you can see you get the well depth. So on the, the particular distance r, okay, this is the distance r where we have the highest attractive interactions. So this is called this distance r. That is called the uh, Van der Waals radius. So from this graph, you can calculate the Van der Waals radius as well as Van der Waals depth. This is this is the epsilon and r. So using this radius and uh, well depth you can calculate a i j and b i j. Then this equation we know a i j we can call to b i j and r i j we can calculate from the 3D structures right because we have the coordinates we can calculate the distance. So, if you know the distance we can easily get the r i power 6 and r i power 12. So, for each atom so we have these specific values for the radius and well depth right to predetermined parameters right you can see this is the r i j and epsilon for different types of atoms whether it is carbon or the C alpha carbon or the different types of atom types you can have this well depth as well as the radius you can use that. So, we discussed about four types of interactions then also we have disulfide bonds the disulfide bonds how disulfide bonds are formed in the oxidative environment if you between the two systems right you can see the S S D S. So, finally, it get the disulfide bonds. So, disulfide bonds are stronger bonds and if you see the side directly experiments. 
For example, if you mutate a cystin to another residue and the cystin makes hydrogen makes disulfide bonds, then how far the energy is lost, change in free energy. Or if you replace any amino acid to cystin and when cystin makes a disulfide bond, how much energy you can gain, right. If you see this is about 2 to 5 kilocal per mole, right, depending upon the location and the environment, approximately we can take this as 2.3 kilocal per mole for each disulfide bond. So, can we see disulfide bonds in all proteins? No, right. Approximately about 20 to 30 proteins only we have the disulfide bonds because you have cysteines and they form disulfide bonds. So, then we come how is the tendency of forming disulfide bonds? If we have the 3D structures, can we identify the disulfide bonds? Yes. You can see, right. You can see the disulfide bonds based on the distance, right. And each protein we know how many disulfide bonds. Based on that, you can calculate the free energy due to disulfide bonds. Now, we calculated almost all the free energies at the folded state enthalpy times. Now, we go with the entropy time. So, right, this is a randomness, we can calculate minus t in delta s. Delta s you can calculate the probability of a residue in a specific rotomer. So, in this case you can see delta s equal to minus r in de delta p i in del l n p i. This is the probability of a residue right in a specific rotomer in a specific conformation right rotate around any single bond. How many rotate uh, conformations each atoms can take. Or you can use this equation delta s r into logarithm of z power x, where x is the number of flexible points where we can rotate, rotate and z is the number of orientations at, at equal energy, where, where the two where places where you can have the orientations. Using these equations, you can calculate t in delta s. This is due to entropy. Then I discuss the unfolded state is not completely unfolded. There are some interactions. To account that, we take 50 percent of the hydrogen bonds, we assume they are in the unfolded state. And this is assumption. So, if you can do that, then non entropic time also we can account to some level. So, now we have the entropic time, we have the enthalpic time, and this is the example for uh, different proteins. But if you calculate now, the, you can see this little bit differences because of the resolutions and other changes. Also, we use various approximations in this model. Now, we can calculate set of proteins and take the total, where the what is the total value of hydrophobic free energy, electrostatic, van der Waals, and all the free energies, and take the sum of all that uh, sum of uh, all the energies all energy. Then we normalize to 1. So, this add up and divide with this total energy. So, then normalize to 1 right. If you do this then you can see approximately the hydrophobic interactions contribute to 50 percent and the hydrogen bonding up to 27 percent, van der Waals 15 percent, electrostatic 6 percent and the disulfide 1 percent. Then we look at these numbers whether these numbers make sense. So, because the heterophobic interactions are dominant, because most of the proteins they follow the heterophobic collapse model and to make this heterophobic residues to be at the interior of the core when the protein folds from the unfolded state to the folded state. That means, heterophobic force is the driving force right, for many proteins and this, this is the reason why this value of more than 50 percent in the case of the heterophobic free energy. Then we look into this second term hydrogen bonding free energy right. What are the major secondary structures from this hydrogen bonding free energy? alpha helices and beta strands right. Secondary structures are mainly formed by hydrogen bonds right. If you see a protein structures predominantly you can see the occurrence of alpha helices or beta strands. In this case the hydrogen bonding free energy also plays an important role. So, if you see this number this is 27 percent right that is also reasonable. Then if you see the electrostatic interactions. So, you can see a limited number of ion pairs between the positive charge and the negative charge. Right. In this case, you can see about 66 percent. Disulfide bridges are strong, but why the percentage is less? Because it is rare, because many proteins they do not have the cysteines or disulfide bonds, and even if the proteins have disulfide bonds, the number is less. This is the reason why the number is less in this case. So, from these numbers, we can tell that the heterophobic interactions are dominant and it is a driving force, it makes the unfolded state protein to initiate folding. When it starts folding, then the other interactions like hydrogen bonds give the shape, for example, the secondary structures alpha helices and beta strands, and the van der Waals electrostatic interactions and keep the protein in a stable state, right. So, heterophobic interactions initiate folding, and the other interactions they give shape and keep the protein in a stable state. Now, the question is if you have these interactions, is it possible to predict the free energy change for any protein of known structure? Yes, because if you see the Lattergy values, they are known only for 300 to 500 proteins. 
but we have the structures how many structures are known at the moment 130,000 right in this case we have more structures but the stability values are known for less number of proteins. So, is it possible to predict the stability from structural information? So, we can relate right for example, if you have a set of proteins for example, 100 proteins if you know all the 100 proteins you calculate all the contributions as we discussed now right if you have the structures we can calculate the interactions right. So, in this case you can calculate all the values right all these free energy values and experiment value also we know. So, then we use the principle of least squares to obtain the coefficients right because we can write O equal to m x plus c if there is only one variable if it is more you can extend in this case we have different contributions ok this is the constant and we have the different coefficients. So, use the principle of least squares you can get the coefficients right and for any protein you can calculate the free energy contributions and then using this equation right you can predict the stability of any proteins of known structure. So, in this case you have the value for the experimental data and if you know the structures you can use these contributions to predict the stability for a set of proteins we can see is a good correlation between the experimental and predicted values the deviation is very less right this was done with less number of proteins, but now we have more number of proteins available right you can extend it and you can refine the values in this case it can be applicable to all the proteins of known structures and you can do the analysis for the different proteins with different stabilities fine summarizing what did we discuss today protein stability protein stability. what is the protein stability so how is the free energy difference between folded, folded and unfolded and states what are the major contributions in the folded state Hydrophobic energy, electrostatic energy, Van der Waals energy, right? Disulfide bonds, hydrogen bonding energy, and so on. So, in the case of unfolded state, what is the major force in the unfolded state? Entropy. Entropy, right? So, now if you know the 3D structures, you can calculate all the energy terms and you can relate these values, right, to understand the contribution of different energies as well as to predict the free energy using 3D structures. In the following classes, we will discuss about the stability of proteins based on amino acid substitutions for example, what will happen if you mutate a specific residue in the stability and if you have structures which residues which contribute to the stability which residues are important for the stability and so on right and then we will uh, discuss about the folding rates or interactions and so on. Thanks for your attention.